Deacon Pitkin's Farm, by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Chapter 1 Miss Diana Thanksgiving was impending in the village of Mapleton on the 20th of November, 1825. The governor's proclamation had been duly and truly read from the pulpit the Sunday before, to the great consternation of Miss Brisket, the ambulatory dressmaker, who declared confidentially to Deacon Pitkin's wife that she didn't see nothin' how she was goin' to get through things and there was Sap Hyrie's gown, and Miss Deacon Trowbridge's cloak, and Lizzie Jane's new merino, not a stroke done on't. The governor ought to be ashamed of himself for hurrying matters so. It was a very rash step for Miss Brisket to go to the length of such a remark about the governor, but the deacon's wife was one of the few women who are non-conductors of indiscretion, and so the governor never heard of it. This particular Thanksgiving tide was marked in Mapleton by exceptionally charming weather. Once in a great while the inclement New England skies are taken with a remorseful twinge and forget to give their usual snap of September frost which generally bites off all the pretty flowers in so heartbreaking a way, and then you can have lovely times quite down through November. It was so this year at Mapleton. Though the Thanksgiving proclamation had been read, and it was past the middle of November, yet marigolds and four o'clocks were all ablaze in the gardens, and the golden rod and purple aster were blooming over the fields as if they were expecting to keep it up all winter. It really is affecting, the jolly good heart with which these bright children of the rainbow flaunt and wave and dance and go on budding and blossoming in the very teeth and snarl of oncoming winter. An autumn golden rod or aster ought to be the symbol for pluck and courage, and might serve a New England crest as the broom flower did the old plantagenets. The trees round Mapleton were looking like gigantic tulip beds, and breaking every hour into new phantasmagoria of color, and the great elm that overshadowed the red Pitkin farmhouse seemed like a dome of gold, and sent a yellow radiance through all the doors and windows as the dreamy autumn sunshine streamed through it. The Pitkin elm was noted among the great trees of New England. Now and then nature asserts herself and does something so astonishing and overpowering as actually to strike through the crust of human stupidity, and convince mankind that a tree is something greater than they are. As a general thing the human race has a stupid hatred of trees. They embrace every chance to cut them down. They have no idea of their fitness for anything but firewood or fruit-bearing. But a great cathedral elm, with shadowy aisles of boughs, its choir of whispering winds and chanting birds, its hush and solemnity and majestic grandeur, actually conquers the dull human race and asserts its leave to be in a manner to which all hearts respond, and so the great elms of New England have got to be regarded with a sort of pride as among her very few crown jewels and the Pitkin elm was one of these. But wasn't it a busy time in Mapleton? Busy is no word for it. Oh, the choppings, the poundings, the stoning of raisins, the projections of pies and puddings, the killing of turkeys who can utter it. The very chip squirrels in the stone walls, who have a family custom of making a market basket of their mouths, were rushing about with chops incredibly distended and their tails had an extra whisk of thanksgiving alertness. A squirrel's thanksgiving dinner is an affair of moment, mind you. In the great roomy, clean kitchen of the deacon's house might be seen the lithe, comely form of Diana Pitkin presiding over the roaring great oven which was to engulf the armies of pies and cakes which were in due course of preparation on the ample tables. Of course you want to know who Diana Pitkin was. It was a general fact about this young lady that anybody who gave one look at her, whether at church or at home, always inquired at once with effusion, who is she, particularly if the inquirer was one of the masculine gender. This was to be accounted for by the fact that Miss Diana presented to the first view of the gazer a dazzling combination of pink and white, a flashing pair of black eyes, a ripple of dimples about the prettiest little rosy mouth in the world, and a frequent somewhat saucy laugh, which showed a set of teeth like pearls. Add to this a quick wit, a generous though spicy temper, and a nimble tongue, 
and you will not wonder that Miss Diana was a marked character at Mapleton, and that the inquiry who she was was one of the most interesting facts of statistical information. Well, she was Deacon Pitkin's second cousin, and of course just in that convenient relationship to the Pitkin boys which has all the advantages of cousinship and none of the disadvantages as may be plain to an ordinary observer. For if Miss Diana wished to ride or row or dance with any of the Pitkin boys, why shouldn't she? Were they not her cousins? But if any of these aforenamed young fellows advanced on the strength of these intimacies a presumptive claim to nearer relationship, why, then Diana was astonished of course she had regarded them as her cousins. And she was sure she couldn't think what they could be dreaming of a cousin is just like a brother, you know. This was just what James Pitkin did not believe in, and now as he is walking over hill and dale from Cambridge College to his father's house he is gathering up a decided resolution to tell Diana that he is not and will not be to her as a brother that she must be to him all or nothing. James is the brightest, the tallest, and, the Mapleton girl said, the handsomest of the Pitkin boys. He is a strong-hearted, generous, resolute fellow as ever undertook to walk thirty-five miles home to eat his Thanksgiving dinner. We are not sure that Miss Diana is not thinking of him quite as much as he of her, as she stands there with the long kitchen shovel in one hand, and one plump white arm thrust into the oven, and her little head cocked on one side, her brows bent, and her rosy mouth pursed up with a solemn sense of the importance of her judgment as she is testing the heat of her oven. O, oh, D, D. For all you seem to have nothing on your mind but the responsibility for all those pumpkin pies and cranberry tarts, we wouldn't venture a very large wager that you are not thinking about Cousin James under it all at this very minute, and that all this pretty bustling housewifeliness owes its spice and flavor to the thought that James is coming to the Thanksgiving dinner. To be sure if anyone had told D so, she would have flouted the very idea. Besides, she had privately informed Elmira Sisson, her special particular confidant, that she knew Jim would come home from college full of conceit, and thinking that everybody must bow down to him, and for her part she meant to make him know his place. Of course Jim and she were good friends, etc., etc. O, oh, D, D. You silly, naughty girl, was it for this that you stood so long at your looking-glass last night? arranging how you would do your hair for the Thanksgiving night dance. Those killing bows which you deliberately fabricated and lodged like bright butterflies among the dark waves of your hair who were you thinking of as you made and posed them? Lay your hand on your heart and say who to you has ever seemed the best, the truest, the bravest and kindest of your friends. But Dee doesn't trouble herself with such thoughts she only cuts out saucy mottoes from the flaky white paste to lay on the red cranberry tarts, of which she makes a special one for each cousin. For there is Bill, the second eldest, who stays at home and helps work the farm. She knows that Bill worships her very shoe tie, and obeys all her mandates with the faithful docility of a good Newfoundland dog and he says she thinks everything of Bill she likes Bill. So she does Ed, who comes a year or two behind Bill, and is trembling out of bashful boyhood. So she does Rob and Ike and Pete and the whole healthy, ramping train who fill the Pitkin farmhouse with a racket of boots and boys. So she has made everyone a tart with his initial on it and a saucy motto or two, just to keep them from being conceited, you know. All day she keeps busy by the side of the deacon's wife a delicate, thin, quiet little woman, with great thoughtful eyes and a step like a snowflake. New England had of old times, and has still, perhaps, in her farmhouses, these women who seem from year to year to develop in the spiritual sphere as the bodily form shrinks and fades. While the cheek grows thin and the form spare, the willpower grows daily stronger, though the outer man perish, the inner man is renewed day by day. The worn hand that seems so weak yet holds every thread and controls every movement of the most complex family life, and wonders are daily accomplished by the presence of a woman who seems little more than a spirit. 
The New England wife mother was the one little jeweled pivot on which all the wheel work of the family moved. Well, haven't we done a good day's work, cousin? says Diana, when ninety pies of every ilk quince, apple, cranberry, pumpkin, and mince have been all safely delivered from the oven and carried up into the great vacant chamber, where, ranged in rows and frozen solid, they are to last over New Year's Day. She adds, demonstratively clasping the little woman round the neck and leaning her bright cheek against her whitening hair, haven't we been smart? And the calm, thoughtful eyes turn lovingly upon her as Mary Pitkin puts her arm round her and answers, Yes, my daughter, you have done wonderfully. We couldn't do without you. And Diana lifts her head and laughs. She likes petting and praising as a cat likes being stroked, but, for all that, the little puss has her claws and a sly notion of using them. Chapter 2 Bea Carter It was in the flush and glow of a gorgeous sunset that you might have seen the dark form of the Pitkin farmhouse rising on a green hill against the orange sky. The red house, with its overhanging canopy of elm, stood out like an old missal picture done on a gold ground. Through the glimmer of the yellow twilight might be seen the stacks of dry corn stalks and heaps of golden pumpkins in the neighboring fields, from which the slow oxen were bringing home a cart well laden with farm produce. It was the hour before supper time, and Bea Carter, the deacon's hired man, was leaning against a fence, waiting for his evening meal indulging the while in a stream of conversational wisdom which seemed to flow all the more freely from having been dammed up through the labors of the day. Bea was, in those far distant times of simplicity a mute and glorious newspaper man. Newspapers in those days were as rare and unheard of as steam cars or the telegraph, but Bea had within him all the making of a thriving modern reporter, and no paper to use it on. He was a walking biographical and statistical dictionary of all the affairs of the good folks of Mapleton. He knew every piece of furniture in their houses, and what they gave for it, every foot of land, and what it was worth, every ox, ass and sheep, every man, woman and child in town. And Bea could give pretty shrewd character pictures also, and whoever wanted to inform himself of the status of any person or thing in Mapleton would have done well to have turned the faucet of Bea's stream of talk, and watched it respectfully as it came, for it was commonly conceded that what Bea Carter didn't know about Mapleton was hardly worth knowing. Putty piece of property, this air farm, he said, surveying the scene around him with the air of a connoisseur. None of your stun pasture land where the sheep can't get their noses down through the rocks without a file to sharpen them. Deacon Pitkin did a putty fair stroke of business when he swapped off his old place for this air. That our old place was all swamp land and stun pasture, wan tea good for raisin nothing but juniper bushes and bullfrogs. But I tell underscore you underscore proceeded Bea, with a shrewd wink, that our mortgage pinches the deacon works him like a dose of aloes and pecri, it does. Deacon fairly gets lean on't. Why, said Abner Jenks, a stolid plow boy to whom this stream of remark was addressed, this air place ain't mortgaged, is it? Do tell, now. Why, yes, don't ye know that are? Why there's risin two thousand dollars due on this air farm? and if the deacon don't scratch for it and pay up square to the minute, old squire nor cross'll foreclose on him. Old squire hain't no bowels, I tell you, and the deacon knows he hain't, and I tell you it keeps the deacon dancin' lively as corn on a hot shovel. The deacon's a master hand to work, said Abner, so's the boys. Way, yes, the deacon is, said Bea, turning contemplatively to the farmhouse, there ain't a critter in that our house that there ain't the most work got out of em that can be, down to Jed and Sam, the little unts. They work like tigers, every soul of em, from four o'clock in she morning as long as they can see, and Miss Pitkin she works all the evening woman's work ain't never done, they say. She's a good woman, 
Mies Pitkin is, said Abner, and she's a smart worker. In this phrase Abner solemnly expressed his highest ideal of a human being. Smart ain't no word for tea, said Bia, with alertness. Declar for tea, the grit of that our woman beats me. Had eight children right along in a string thout stoppin', done all her own work, never kept no gal nor nothin', allers up and dressed, allers to meetin' Sunday, and to the prayer meetin' weekly, and never stops workin', when taught one thing it's another cookin', washin', ironin', making butter and cheese, and tween spells cuttin' and sewin', and if she ain't doin' that, why, she's braidin' straw to sell to the store or knitting she's the perpetual motion ready found, Mies Pitkin is. Want Terrace no, said the auditor, as a sort of musical rest in this monotone of talk. Ain't she smart, though? Smart. Well, I should think she was. She's over and into everything that's goin' on in that house. The deacon wouldn't know himself without her, nor wouldn't none of them boys, they just live out of her, she kinda keeps em all up. Wall, she ain't a hefty woman, now, said the interlocutor, who seemed to be possessed by a dim idea that worth must be weighed by the pound. Law bless you, no. She's a little critter, nothin' to look to, but every bit in her is underscore live underscore. She looks pale, kinda slips round still like moonshine, but where anything's to be done, there Miss Pitkin is, and her hand allers goes to the right spot, and things is done afore ye know it. That our woman's kinda still, she'll slip off and be gone to heaven some day afore folks know it. There comes the deacon and Jim over the hill. Jim walked home from college day four yesterday, and turned right into day to help get in the taters, workin' right along. Deacon was awful grouty. What was the matter of the deacon? Oh, the mortgage kinda works him. The time to pay comes round putty soon, and the deacon's face allers goes down long as your arm. Tis a putty tight pull havin' Jim in college, losin his work and havin term bills and things to pay. Them are college folks charges underscore up underscore, I tell you. I seen it works the deacon, I heard him a jawin Jim bout it. What made Jim go to college? said Abner with slow wonder in his heavy face. Oh, he allers was sought on edication, and Miss Pitkin she's sought aunt, too, in her softly way, and softly women is them that generally carries their pints, fust or last. But there's one that ain't softly, Bea suddenly continued, as the vision of a black-haired, bright-eyed girl suddenly stepped forth from the doorway, and stood shading her face with her hands, looking towards the sunset. The evening light lit up a jaunty spray of golden rod that she had wreathed in her wavy hair, and gave a glow to the rounded outlines of her handsome form. There's a sparkler for you. And no saint, neither. Was Bea's comment. That critter has got more prances and capers in her than any three-year-old filly I knows on. He'll be cunning that ever gets a bridle on her. Some says she's going to have Jim Pitkin, and some says it's Bill, said Abner, delighted to be able to add his mite of gossip to the stream while it was flowing. She's sweet on Jim while he's round, and she's sweet on Bill when Jim's up to college, and between em she gets took round to everything that going. She gives one a word over one shoulder, and one over t'other, and if the Lord above knows what's in that gal's mind or what she's up to, he knows more than I do, or she either, else I lose my bet. Bea made this admission with a firmness that might have been a model to theologians or philosophers in general. There was a point, it appeared, where he was not omniscient. His universal statistical knowledge had a limit. Chapter 3 The Shadow There is no moment of life, however festive, that does not involve the near presence of a possible tragedy. When the concert of life is playing the gayest and airiest music, it requires only the change of a little flat or sharp to modulate into the minor key. 
There seemed at first glance only the elements of joyousness and gaiety in the surroundings at the Pitkin farm. Thanksgiving was come the family, healthy, rosy, and noisy, were all under the one roof tree. There was energy, youth, intelligence, beauty, a pair of lovers on the eve of betrothal just in that misty, golden twilight that precedes the full sunrise of avowed and accepted love and yet behind it all was walking with stealthy step the shadow of a coming sorrow. What in the world ails James? said Diana as she retreated from the door and surveyed him at a distance from her chamber window. His face was like a landscape over which a thundercloud has drifted, and he walked beside his father with a peculiar air of proud displeasure and repression. At that moment the young man was struggling with the bitterest sorrow that can befall youth the breaking up of his life purpose. He had just come to a decision to sacrifice his hopes of education, his man's ambition, his love, his home and family, and become a wanderer on the face of the earth. How this befell requires a sketch of character. Deacon Silas Pitkin was a fair specimen of a class of men not uncommon in New England men too sensitive for the severe physical conditions of New England life, and therefore both suffering and inflicting suffering. He was a man of the finest moral traits, of incorruptible probity, of scrupulous honor, of an exacting conscientiousness, and of a sincere piety. But he had begun life with nothing, his whole standing in the world had been gained inch by inch by the most unremitting economy and self-denial, and he was a man of little capacity for hope, of whom it was said, in popular phraseology, that he took things hard. He was never sanguine of good, always expectant of evil, and seemed to view life like a sentinel forbidden to sleep and constantly under arms. For such a man to be harassed by a mortgage upon his homestead was a steady wear and drain upon his vitality. There were times when a positive horror of darkness came down upon him when his wife's untroubled, patient hopefulness seemed to him like recklessness, when the smallest item of expense was an intolerable burden, and the very daily bread of life was full of bitterness, and when these paroxysms were upon him, one of the heaviest of his burdens was the support of his son in college. It was true that he was proud of his son's talents and sympathized with his love for learning he had to the full that sense of the value of education which is the very vital force of the New England mind and in an hour when things looked brighter to him he had given his consent to the scheme of a college education freely. James was industrious, frugal, energetic, and had engaged to pay the most of his own expenses by teaching in the long winter vacations. But unfortunately this year the Mapleton Academy, which had been promised to him for the winter term, had been taken away by a little maneuver of local politics and given to another, thus leaving him without resource. This disappointment, coming just at the time when the yearly interest upon the mortgage was due, had brought upon his father one of those paroxysms of helpless gloom and discouragement in which the very world itself seemed clothed in sackcloth. From the time that he heard the academy was gone, Deacon Silas lay awake nights in the blackness of darkness. We shall all go to the poorhouse together that's where it will end, he said, as he tossed restlessly in the dark. Oh no, no, my dear, said his wife, with those serene eyes that had looked through so many gloomy hours, we must cast our care on God. It's easy for women to talk. You don't have the interest money to pay, you are perfectly reckless of expense. Nothing would do but James must go to college, and now see what it's bringing us to. Why, father, I thought you yourself were in favor of it. Well, I did wrong then. You persuaded me into it. I'd no business to have listened to you and Jem and got all this load on my shoulders. Yet Mary Pitkin knew in her own calm, clear head that she had not been reckless of expense. The yearly interest money was ever before her, and her own incessant toils had wrought no small portion of what was needed to pay it. Her butter at the store commanded the very highest price, her straw braiding sold for a little more than that of any other hand, 
and she had calculated all the returns so exactly that she felt sure that the interest money for that year was safe. She had seen her husband pass through this nervous crisis many times before, and she had learned to be blamed in silence, for she was a woman out of whom all selfness had long since died, leaving only the tender pity of the nurse and the consoler. Her soul rested on her Savior, the one ever-present, inseparable friend, and when it did no good to speak to her husband, she spoke to her God for him, and so was peaceful and peace-giving. Even her husband himself felt her strengthening, rest-giving power, and for this reason he bore down on her with the burden of all his tremors and his cares, for while he disputed, he yet believed her, and rested upon her with an utter helpless trust, as the good angel of his house. Had she for a moment given way to apprehension, had her step been a thought less firm, her eye less peaceful, then indeed the world itself would have seemed to be sinking under his feet. Meanwhile she was to him that kind of relief which we derive from a person to whom we may say everything without a fear of its harming them. He felt quite sure that, say what he would, Mary would always be hopeful and courageous, and he felt some secret idea that his own gloomy forebodings were of service in restricting and sobering what seemed to him her too sanguine nature. He blindly reverenced, without ability fully to comprehend, her exalted religious fervor and the quietude of soul that it brought. But he did not know through how many silent conflicts, how many prayers, how many tears, how many hopes resigned and sorrows welcomed, she had come into that last refuge of sorrowful souls, that immovable peace when all life's anguish ceases and the will of God becomes the final rest. But, Unhappily for this present crisis, there was, as there often is in family life, just enough of the father's nature in the son to bring them into collision with each other. James had the same nervously anxious nature, the same intense feeling of responsibility, the same tendency towards morbid earnestness, and on that day there had come collision. His father had poured forth upon him his fears and apprehensions in a manner which implied a censure on his son as being willing to accept a life of scholarly ease while his father and mother were, as he expressed it, working their lives away. But I tell you, Father, as God is my witness, I mean to pay all, you shall not suffer, interest and principal all that my work would bring I engage to pay back. You. You'll never have anything. You'll be a poor man as long as you live lost the academy this fall that tells the story. But, father, it wasn't my fault that I lost the academy. It's no matter whose fault it was that's neither here nor there you lost it, and here you are with the vacation before you and nothing to do. There's your mother, she's working herself to death, she never gets any rest. I expect she'll go off in a consumption one of these days. There, there, father that's enough. Please don't say any more. You'll see I will find something to do. There are words spoken at times in life that do not sound bitter though they come from a pitiable depth of anguish, and as James turned from his father he had taken a resolution that convulsed him with pain, his strong arms quivered with the repressed agony, and he hastily sought a distant part of the field, and began cutting and stacking cornstalks with a nervous energy. Why, ye work like thunder! was Bia's comment. Book Larnin hain't spiled ye yet, your arms are good for southern. Yes, my arms are good for something, and I'll use them for something, said Jim. There was raging a tempest in his soul. For a young fellow of a Puritan education in those days to be angry with his father was somewhat that seemed to him as awful a sacrilege as to be angry with his God and yet he felt that his father had been bitterly, cruelly unjust towards him. He had driven economy to the most stringent extremes, he had avoided the intimacy of his class fellows, lest he should be drawn into needless expenses, he had borne with shabby clothing and mean fare among better dressed and richer associates, and been willing to bear it. He had studied faithfully, unremittingly, for two years, but at the moment he turned from his father the throb that wrung his heart was the giving up of all. 
He had in his pocket a letter from his townsman and schoolmate, Sam Allen, mate of an East India man just fitting out at Salem, and it said, We are going to sail with a picked crew, and we want one just such a fellow as you for third mate. Come along, and you can go right up, and your college mathematics will be all the better for us. Come right off, and your berth will be ready, and away for round the world. Here, to be sure, was immediate position wages employment freedom from the intolerable burden of dependence, but it was accepted at the sacrifice of all his life's hopes. True, that in those days the experiment of a seafaring life had often, even in instances which he recalled, brought forth fortune and an ability to settle down in peaceful competence in after life. But there was Diana. Would she wait for him? Encircled on all sides with lovers, would she keep faith with an adventurer gone for an indefinite quest? The desponding, self-distrusting side of his nature said, No. Why should she? Then, to go was to give up Diana to make up his mind to have her belong to some other. Then there was his mother. An unutterable reverential pathos always to him encircled the idea of his mother. Her life to him seemed a hard one. From the outside, as he viewed it, it was all self-sacrifice and renunciation. Yet he knew that she had set her heart on an education for him, as much as it could be set on anything earthly. He was her pride, her hope, and just now that very thought was full of bitterness. There was no help for it, he must not let her work herself to death for him, he would make the household vessel lighter by the throwing himself into the sea, to sink or swim as might happen, and then, perhaps, he might come back with money to help them all. All this was what was surging and boiling in his mind when he came in from his work to the supper that night. Chapter 4 The Goodbye Diana Pitkin was like some of the fruits of her native hills, full of juices which tend to sweetness in maturity, but which when not quite ripe have a pretty decided dash of sharpness. There are grapes that require a frost to ripen them, and Diana was somewhat akin to these. She was a meddlesome, warm-blooded creature, full of the energy and audacity of youth, to whom as yet life was only a frolic and a play spell. Work never tired her. She ate heartily, slept peacefully, went to bed laughing, and got up in a merry humor in the morning. Diana's laugh was as early a note as the song of birds. Such a nature is not at first sympathetic. It has in it some of the unconscious cruelty which belongs to nature itself, whose sunshine never pales at human trouble. Eyes that have never wept cannot comprehend sorrow. Moreover, a lively girl of eighteen, looking at life out of eyes which bewilder others with their brightness, does not always see the world truly, and is sometimes judged to be heartless when she is only immature. Nothing was further from Diana's thoughts than that any grave trouble was overhanging her lover's mind for her lover she very well knew that James was, and she had arranged beforehand to herself very pretty little comedies of life, to be duly enacted in the long vacation, in which James was to appear as the suitor, and she, not too soon nor with too much eagerness, was at last to acknowledge to him how much he was to her. But meanwhile he was not to be too presumptuous. It was not set down in the cards that she should be too gracious or make his way too easy. When, therefore, he brushed by her hastily, on entering the house, with a flushed cheek and frowning brow, and gave no glance of admiration at the pretty toilet she had found time to make, she was slightly indignant. She was as ignorant of the pain which went like an arrow through his heart at the sight of her as the bobolink which whirs and chitters and tweedles over a grave. She turned away and commenced a kitten-like frolic with Bill, who was always only too happy to second any of her motions, and readily promised that after supper she would go with him a walk of half a mile over to a neighbor's, where was a corn husking. A great golden lamp of a harvest moon was already coming up in the fading flush of the evening sky, and she promised herself much amusement in watching the result of her maneuver on James. He'll see at any rate that I am not waiting his beck and call. 
Next time, if he wants my company he can ask for it in season. I'm not going to indulge him in sulks, not I these college fellows worry over books till they hurt their digestion, and then have the blues and look as if the world was coming to an end. And Diana went to the looking glass and rearranged the spray of goldenrod in her hair and nodded at herself defiantly, and then turned to help get on the supper. The Pitkin folk that night sat down to an ample feast, over which the impending Thanksgiving shed its hilarity. There was not only the inevitable great pewter platter, scoured to silver brightness, in the center of the table, and piled with solid masses of boiled beef, pork, cabbage and all sorts of vegetables, and the equally inevitable smoking loaf of rye and Indian bread, to accompany the pot of baked pork and beans, but there were specimens of all the newly made Thanksgiving pies filling every available space on the table. Diana set special value on herself as a pie artist, and she had taxed her ingenuity this year to invent new varieties, which were received with bursts of applause by the boys. These sat down to the table in democratic equality, via Carter and Abner with all the sons of the family, old and young, each eager, hungry and noisy, and over all, with moonlight calmness and steadiness, Mary Pitkin ruled and presided, dispensing to each his portion in due season, while Diana, restless and mischievous as a sprite, seemed to be possessed with an elfin spirit of drollery, venting itself in sundry little tricks and antics which drew ready laughs from the boys and reproving glances from the deacon. For the deacon was that night in one of his severest humors. As Bea Carter afterwards remarked of that night, you could feel there was thunder in the air somewhere round. The deacon had got on about his longest face, and when the deacon's face is about down to its voost, why, it would stop a robin singin' there couldn't nothin' stan it. Tonight the severely cut lines of his face had even more than usual of haggard sternness, and the handsome features of James beside him, in their fixed gravity, presented that singular likeness which often comes out between father and son in seasons of mental emotion. Diana in vain sought to draw a laugh from her cousin. In pouring his home-brewed beer she contrived to spatter him, but he wiped it off without a smile and let pass in silence some arrows of raillery that she had directed at his somber face. When they rose from table, however, he followed her into the pantry. Diana, will you take a walk with me tonight? He said, in a voice husky with repressed feeling. Tonight? Why, I have just promised Bill to go with him over to the husking at the Jenkses. Why don't you go with us? We're going to have lots of fun, she added with an innocent air of not perceiving his gravity. I can't, he said. Besides I wanted to walk with you alone. I had something special I wanted to say. Bless me, how you frighten one. You look solemn as a hearse, but I promise to go with Bill tonight, and I suspect another time will do just as well. What you have to say will keep, I suppose she said mischievously. He turned away quickly. I should really like to know what's the matter with you tonight, she added, but as she spoke he went upstairs and shut the door. He's cross tonight, was Diana's comment. Well, he'll have to get over his pet. I shan't mind it. Upstairs in his room James began the work of putting up the bundle with which he was to go forth to seek his fortune. There stood his books, silent and dear witnesses of the world of hope and culture and refined enjoyment he had been meaning to enter. He was to know them no more. Their mute faces seemed to look at him mournfully as parting friends. He rapidly made his selection, for that night he was to be off in time to reach the vessel before she sailed, and he felt even glad to avoid the Thanksgiving festivities for which he had so little relish. Diana's frolicsome gaiety seemed heartbreaking to him, on the same principle that the poet sings. How can ye chant, ye little birds? And I say weary, fu a care. To the heart struck through with its first experiences of real suffering all nature is full of cruelty, and the young and light-hearted are a large part of nature. She has no feeling, he said to himself. Well, 
There is one reason the more for my going. She won't break her heart for me, nobody loves me but mother, and it's for her s- She mustn't work herself to death for me. And then he sat down in the window to write a note to be given to his mother after he had sailed, for he could not trust himself to tell her what he was about to do. He knew that she would try to persuade him to stay, and he felt faint-hearted when he thought of her. She would sit up early and late, and work for me to the last gasp, he thought, but father was right. It is selfish of me to take it, and so he sat trying to fashion his parting note into a tone of cheerfulness. My dear mother, he wrote, this will come to you when I have set off on a four years voyage round the world. Father has convinced me that it's time for me to be doing something for myself, and I couldn't get a school to keep and, after all, education is got other ways than at college. It's hard to go, because I love home, and hard because you will miss me though no one else will. But father may rely upon it, I will not be a burden on him another day. I shall never come back till I have enough to do for myself, and you too. So goodbye, dear mother. I know you will always pray for me, and wherever I am I shall try to do just as I think you would want me to do. I know your prayers will follow me, and I shall always be your affectionate son. P.S. The boys may have those chestnuts and walnuts in my room and in my drawer there is a bit of ribbon with a locket on it I was going to give cousin Diana. Perhaps she won't care for it, though, but if she does, she is welcome to it it may put her in mind of old times. And this is all he said, with bitterness in his heart, as he leaned on the window and looked out at the great yellow moon that was shining so bright as to show the golden hues of the overhanging elm boughs and the scarlet of an adjoining maple. A light ripple of laughter came up from below, and a chestnut thrown up struck him on the hand, and he saw Diana and Bill step from out the shadowy porch. There's a chestnut for you, Mr. Owl, she called, gaily, if you will stay moping up there. Come, now, it's a splendid evening, won't you come? No, thank you. I shan't be missed, was the reply. That's true enough, the loss is your own. Goodbye, Mr. Philosopher. Goodbye, Diana. Something in the tone struck strangely through her heart. It was the voice of what Diana never had felt yet deep suffering and she gave a little shiver. What an awfully solemn voice James has sometimes, she said, and then added, with a laugh, it would make his fortune as a Methodist minister. The sound of the light laugh and little snatches and echoes of gay talk came back like heartless elves to mock Jim's sorrow. So much for her, he said, and turned to go and look for his mother. Chapter 5 Mother and Son He knew where he should find her. There was a little, low workroom adjoining the kitchen that was his mother's sanctum. There stood her work basket there were always piles and piles of work, begun or finished, and there also her few books at hand, to be glanced into in rare snatches of leisure in her busy life. The old times New England house mother was not a mere unreflective drudge of domestic toil. She was a reader and a thinker, keenly appreciative in intellectual regions. The literature of that day in New England was sparse, but whatever there was, whether in this country or in England, that was noteworthy, was matter of keen interest, and Mrs. Pitkin's small library was very dear to her. No nun in a convent under vows of abstinence ever practiced more rigorous self-denial than she did in the restraints and government of intellectual tastes and desires. Her son was dear to her as the fulfillment and expression of her unsatisfied craving for knowledge, the possessor of those fair fields of thought which duty forbade her to explore. James stood and looked in at the window, and saw her sorting and arranging the family mending, busy over piles of stockings and shirts, while on the table beside her lay her open Bible, and she was singing to herself, in a low, sweet undertone, one of the favorite minor keyed melodies of those days, O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, 
our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. An indescribable feeling, blended of pity and reverence, swelled in his heart as he looked at her and marked the whitening hair, the thin worn little hands so busy with their love work, and thought of all the bearing and forbearing, the waiting, the watching, the long-suffering that had made up her life for so many years. The very look of exquisite calm and resolved strength in her patient eyes and in the gentle lines of her face had something that seemed to him sad and awful as the purely spiritual always looks to the more animal nature. With his blood bounding and tingling in his veins, his strong arms pulsating with life, and his heart full of a man's vigor and resolve, his mother's life seemed to him to be one of weariness and drudgery, of constant, unceasing self-abnegation. Calm he knew she was, always sustained, never faltering, but her victory was one which, like the spiritual sweetness in the face of the dying, had something of sadness for the living heart. He opened the door and came in, sat down by her on the floor, and laid his head in her lap. Mother, you never rest, you never stop working. Oh, no. She said gaily, I'm just going to stop now. I had only a few last things I wanted to get done. Mother, I can't bear to think of you, your life is too hard. We all have our amusements, our rests, our changes, your work is never done, you are worn out, and get no time to read, no time for anything but drudgery. Don't say drudgery, my boy work done for those we love never is drudgery. I'm so happy to have you all around me I never feel it. But, mother, you are not strong, and I don't see how you can hold out to do all you do. Well, she said simply, when my strength is all gone I ask God for more, and he always gives it. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And her hand involuntarily fell on the open Bible. Yes, I know it, he said following her hand with his eyes while mother, he said, I want you to give me your Bible and take mine. I think yours would do me more good. There was a little bright flush and a pleased smile on his mother's face. Certainly, my boy, I will. I see you have marked your favorite places, he added. It will seem like hearing you speak to read them. With all my heart, she added taking up the Bible and kissing his forehead as she put it into his hands. There was a struggle in his heart how to say farewell without saying it without letting her know that he was going to leave her. He clasped her in his arms and kissed her again and again. Mother, he said, if I ever get into heaven it will be through you. Don't say that, my son it must be through a better friend than I am who loves you more than I do. I have not died for you he did. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, then. You I can see him I cannot. His mother looked at him with a face full of radiance, pity, and hope. I feel sure you underscore will underscore she said. You are consecrated, she added, in a low voice, laying her hand on his head. Amen, said James, in a reverential tone. He felt that she was at that moment as she often was silently speaking to one invisible of and for him, and the sense of it stole over him like a benediction. There was a pause of tender silence for many minutes. Well, I must not keep you up any longer, mother dear it's time you were resting. Good night. And with a long embrace and kiss they separated. He had yet fifteen miles to walk to reach the midnight stage that was to convey him to Salem. As he was starting from the house with his bundle in his hand, the sound of a gay laugh came through the distant shrubbery. It was Diana and Bill returning from the husking. Hastily he concealed himself behind a clump of old lilac bushes till they emerged into the moonlight and passed into the house. Diana was in one of those paroxysms of young girl frolic which are the effervescence of young, healthy blood, as natural as the gyrations of a bobolink on a clover head. James was thinking of dark nights and stormy seas, years of exile, mother's sorrows, home perhaps never to be seen more, 
and the laugh jarred on him like a terrible discord. He watched her into the house, turned, and was gone. Chapter 6 Gone to Sea A little way on in his moonlight walk James's ears were saluted by the sound of someone whistling and crackling through the bushes, and soon Bea Carter, emerged into the moonlight, having been out to the same husking where Diana and Bill had been enjoying themselves. The sight of him resolved a doubt which had been agitating James's mind. The note to his mother which was to explain his absence and the reasons for it was still in his coat pocket, and he had designed sending it back by some messenger at the tavern where he took the midnight stage, but here was a more trusty party. It involved, to be sure, the necessity of taking Bea into his confidence. James was well aware that to tell that acute individual the least particle of a story was like starting a gimlet in a pine board there was no stop till it had gone through. So he told him in brief that a good berth had been offered to him on the Eastern Star, and he meant to take it to relieve his father of the pressure of his education. Wall now you don't say so, was Bea's commentary. Wall, yes, tis hard sledden for the deacon dreadful hard sledden. Wall, now, s'pose your disappointed shouldn't wonder just so. Edication's a good thing, but taint the only thing now, folks larns a sight rubbin round the world and then they make money. Just see, there's Cap'n Stebbins and Cap'n Andrews and Cap'n Merriweather all livin on good farms, with good, nice houses, all got goin to see. Expect Miss Pitkin'll take it sorta hard, she's so sot on you but she's allers sayin' things is for the best, and maybe she'll come to think so bout this folks genially does when they can't help themselves. Wall, yes, now goin' to walk to the crossroad tavern? Better not. Just wait a minute and I'll hitch up and take ye over. Thank you, Bea, but I can't stop, and I'd rather walk, so I won't trouble you. Wall, look here don't ye want a sort a nest egg? I've got fifty silver dollars laid up, you take it on venture and give me half what it brings. Thank you, Bea. If you'll trust me with it I'll hope to do something for us both. Bea went into the house, and after some fumbling brought out a canvas bag, which he put into James's hand. Wanted to go to see confoundedly myself, but there's Mariar Jane she won't hear aunt and turns on the waterworks if I peep a single word. Farman's dreadful slow, but when a feller's got a gal he's got a cap'n, he has to mind orders. So you just trade and we'll go shears. I think considerable of you, and I expect you'll make it go as fur as anybody. I'll try my best, you may believe, Bea, said James, shaking the hard hand heartily, as he turned on his way towards the crossroads tavern. The whole village of Maplewood on Thanksgiving Day morning was possessed of the fact that James Pitkin had gone off to sea in the underscore Eastern Star underscore, for Bea had felt all the sense of importance which the possession of a startling piece of intelligence gives to one, and took occasion to call at the tavern and store on his way up and make the most of his information, so that by the time the bell rang for service the news might be said to be everywhere. The minister's general custom on Thanksgiving Day was to get off a political sermon reviewing the state of New England, the United States of America, and Europe, Asia, and Africa, but it may be doubted if all the affairs of all these continents produced as much sensation among the girls in the singer's seat that day as did the news that James Pitkin had gone to sea on a four years' voyage. Curious eyes were cast on Diana Pitkin, and many were the whispers and speculations as to the part she might have had in the move, and certainly she looked paler and graver than usual, and some thought they could detect traces of tears on her cheeks, some noticed in the tones of her voice that day, as they rose in the soprano, a tremor and pathos never remarked before the unconscious utterance of a new sense of sorrow, awakened in a soul that up to this time had never known a grief for the letter had fallen on the heads of the Pitkin household like a thunderbolt. Bea came in to breakfast and gave it to Mrs. Pitkin, saying that James had handed him that last night, on his way over to take the midnight stage to Salem, 
where he was going to sail on the eastern star today no doubt he's off to sea by this time. A confused sound of exclamations went up around the table, while Mrs. Pitkin, pale and calm, read the letter and then passed it to her husband without a word. The bright, fixed color in Diana's face had meanwhile been slowly ebbing away, till, with cheeks and lips pale as ashes, she hastily rose and left the table and went to her room. A strange, new, terrible pain a sensation like being choked or smothered a rush of mixed emotions a fearful sense of some inexorable, unalterable crisis having come of her girlish folly overwhelmed her. Again she remembered the deep tones of his goodbye, and how she had only mocked at his emotion. She sat down and leaned her head on her hands in a tearless, confused sorrow. Deacon Pitkin was at first more shocked and overwhelmed than his wife. His yesterday's talk with James had no such serious purpose. It had been only the escape valve for his hypochondriac forebodings of the future, and nothing was farther from his thoughts than having it bear fruit in any such decisive movement on the part of his son. In fact, he secretly was proud of his talents and his scholarship, and had set his heart on his going through college and had no more serious purpose in what he said the day before than the general one of making his son feel the difficulties and straits he was put to for him. Young men were tempted at college to be too expensive, he thought, and to forget what it cost their parents at home. In short, the whole thing had been merely the passing off of a paroxysm of hypochondria, and he had already begun to be satisfied that he should raise his interest money that year without material difficulty. The letter showed him too keenly the depth of the suffering he had inflicted on his son, and when he had read it he cast a sort of helpless, questioning look on his wife, and said, after an interval of silence, Well, mother. There was something quite pathetic in the appealing look and voice. Well, father, she answered in subdued tones, all we can do now is to leave it. Leave it. Those were words often in that woman's mouth, and they expressed that habit of her life which made her victorious over all troubles, that habit of trust in the infinite will that actually could and did leave every accomplished event in his hand, without murmur and without conflict. If there was any one thing in her uniformly self-denied life that had been a personal ambition and a personal desire, it had been that her son should have a college education. It was the center of her earthly wishes, hopes and efforts. That wish had been cut off in a moment, that hope had sunk under her feet, and now only remained to her the task of comforting the undisciplined soul whose unguided utterances had wrought the mischief. It was not the first time that, wounded by a loving hand in this dark struggle of life, she had suppressed the pain of her own hurt that he that had wounded her might the better forgive himself. Dear father, she said to him, when over and over he blamed himself for his yesterday's harsh words to his son, don't worry about it now, you didn't mean it. James is a good boy, and he'll see it right at last, and he is in God's hands, and we must leave him there he overrules all. When Mrs. Pitkin turned from her husband she sought Diana in her room. Oh, cousin! Cousin! said the girl, throwing herself into her arms. Is this true? Is James gone? Can't we do anything? Can't we get him back? I've been thinking it over. Oh, if the ship wouldn't sail! And I'd go to Salem and beg him to come back, on my knees. Oh, if I had only known yesterday! Oh, cousin, cousin! He wanted to talk with me, and I wouldn't hear him. Oh, if I only had, I could have persuaded him out of it. Oh, why didn't I know? There, there, dear child! We must accept it just as it is, now that it is done. Don't feel so. We must try to look at the good. Oh, show me that letter! said Diana, and Mrs. Pitkin, hoping to tranquilize her, gave her James's note. He thinks I don't care for him, she said, reading it hastily. Well, I don't wonder. But I underscore do underscore care. I love him better than anybody or anything under the sun, 
and I never will forget him, he's a brave, noble, good man, and I shall love him as long as I live I don't care who knows it. Give me that locket, cousin, and write to him that I shall wear it to my grave. Dear child, there is no writing to him. Oh, dear! That's the worst. Oh, that horrid, horrid sea! It's like death you don't know where they are, and you can't hear from them and a four years' voyage. Oh, dear! Oh, dear! Don't, dear child, don't, you distress me, said Mrs. Pitkin. Yes, that's just like me, said Diana, wiping her eyes. Here I am thinking only of myself, and you that have had your heart broken are trying to comfort me, and trying to comfort cousin Silas. We have both of us scolded and flouted him away, and now you, who suffer the most of either of us, spend your breath to comfort us. It's just like you. But, cousin, I'll try to be good and comfort you. I'll try to be a daughter to you. You need somebody to think of you, for you never think of yourself. Let's go in his room, she said, and taking the mother by the hand they crossed to the empty room. There was his writing table, there his forsaken books, his papers, some of his clothes hanging in his closet. Mrs. Pitkin, opening a drawer, took out a locket hung upon a bit of blue ribbon, where there were two locks of hair, one of which Diana recognized as her own, and one of James's. She hastily hung it about her neck and concealed it in her bosom, laying her hand hard upon it, as if she would still the beatings of her heart. It seems like a death, she said. Don't you think the ocean is like death wide, dark, stormy, unknown? We cannot speak to or hear from them that are on it. But people can and do come back from the sea, said the mother, soothingly. I trust, in God's own time, we shall see James back. But what if we never should? Oh, cousin! I can't help thinking of that. There was Michael Davis, you know the ship was never heard from. Well, said the mother, after a moment's pause and a choking down of some rising emotion, and turning to a table on which lay a Bible, she opened and read, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. The thee in this psalm was not to her a name, a shadow, a cipher, to designate the unknowable it stood for the inseparable heart-friend the father seeing in secret, on whose bosom all her tears of sorrow had been shed, the comforter and guide forever dwelling in her soul, and giving peace where the world gave only trouble. Diana beheld her face as it had been the face of an angel. She kissed her, and turned away in silence. Chapter 7 Thanksgiving Again Seven years had passed and once more the Thanksgiving tide was in Mapleton. This year it had come cold and frosty. Chill driving autumn storms had stripped the painted glories from the trees, and remorseless frosts had chased the hardy ranks of the asters and goldenrods back and back till scarce a blossom could be found in the deepest and most sequestered spots. The great elm over the Pitkin farmhouse had been stripped of its golden glory, and now rose against the yellow evening sky, with its infinite delicacies of network and tracery, in their way quite as beautiful as the full pomp of summer foliage. The air without was keen and frosty, and the knotted twigs of the branches knocked against the roof and rattled and ticked against the upper window panes as the chill evening wind swept through them. Seven long years had passed since James sailed. Years of watching, of waiting, of cheerful patience, at first, and at last of resigned sorrow. Once they heard from James, at the first port where the ship stopped. It was a letter dear to his mother's heart, manly, resigned and Christian, expressing full purpose to work with God in whatever calling he should labor, and cheerful hopes of the future. Then came a long, long silence, and then tidings that the eastern star had been wrecked on a reef in the Indian Ocean. The mother had given back her treasure into the same beloved hands whence she first received him. I gave him to God, and God took him, she said. I shall have him again in God's time. 
This was how she settled the whole matter with herself. Diana had mourned with all the vehement intensity of her being, but out of the deep baptism of sorrow she had emerged with a new and nobler nature. The vain, trifling, laughing Undine had received a soul and was a true woman. She devoted herself to James's mother with an utter self-sacrificing devotion, resolved as far as in her lay to be both son and daughter to her. She read, and studied, and fitted herself as a teacher in a neighboring academy, and persisted in claiming the right of a daughter to place all the amount of her earnings in the family purse. And this year there was special need. With all his care, with all his hard work and that of his family, Deacon Silas never had been able to raise money to annihilate the debt upon the farm. There seemed to be a perfect fatality about it. Let them all make what exertions they might, just as they were hoping for a sum that should exceed the interest and begin the work of settling the principal would come some loss that would throw them all back. One year their barn was burned just as they had housed their hay. On another a valuable horse died, and then there were fits of sickness among the children, and poor crops in the field, and low prices in the market, in short, as Bea remarked, the deacon's luck did seem to be a sort of streaky, for do what you might there's always southern to put him back. As the younger boys grew up the deacon had ceased to hire help, and Bea had transferred his services to Squire Jones, a rich landholder in the neighborhood, who wanted someone to overlook his place. The increased wages had enabled him to give a home to Maria Jane and a start in life to two or three sturdy little American citizens who played around his house door. Nevertheless, Bea never lost sight of the deacon's folks in his multifarious cares, and never missed an opportunity either of doing them a good turn or of picking up any stray item of domestic news as to how matters were going on in that interior. He had privately broached the theory to Miss Brisket, that arter all it was James that Diony, he always pronounced all names as if they ended in Y, was sought on, and that she took it so hard, his going off, that it did beat all. Seemed to make another gal of her, he shouldn't wonder if she'd come out and gin the church. And Diana not long after unconsciously fulfilled Bea's predictions. Of late Bea's good offices had been in special requisition, as the deacon had been for nearly a month on a sick bed with one of those interminable attacks of typhus fever which used to prevail in old times, when the doctor did everything he could to make it certain that a man once brought down with sickness never should rise again. But Silas Pitkin had a constitution derived through an indefinite distance from a temperate, hard-working, godly ancestry, and so withstood both death and the doctor, and was alive and in a convalescent state, which gave hope of his being able to carve the turkey at his Thanksgiving dinner. The evening sunlight was just fading out of the little keeping room, adjoining the bedroom, where the convalescent now was able to sit up most of the day. A cot bed had been placed there, designed for him to lie down upon in intervals of fatigue. At present, however, he was sitting in his armchair, complacently watching the blaze of the hickory fire, or following placidly the motions of his wife's knitting needles. There was an air of calmness and repose on his thin, worn features that never was there in days of old, the haggard, anxious lines had been smoothed away, and that spiritual expression which sickness and sorrow sometimes develops on the human face reigned in its place. It was the clear shining after rain. Wife, he said, read me something I can't quite remember out of the Bible. It's in the eighth of Deuteronomy, the second verse. Mrs. Pitkin opened the big family Bible on the stand, and read, And thou shalt remember all the way in which the Lord thy God hath led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what is in thy heart, and whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. There, that's it, interrupted the deacon. That's what I've been thinking of as I've lain here sick and helpless. 
I've fought hard to keep things straight and clear the farm, but it's pleased the Lord to bring me low. I've had to lie still and leave all in his hands. And where better could you leave all? said his wife, with a radiant smile. Well, just so. I've been saying, here I am, Lord, do with me as seemeth to thee good, and I feel a great quiet now. I think it's doubtful if we make up the interest this year. I don't know what Bill may get for the hay, but I don't see much prospect of raisin aunt, and yet I don't worry. Even if it's the Lord's will to have the place sold up and we be turned out in our old age, I don't seem to worry about it. His will be done. There was a sound of rattling wheels at this moment, and anon there came a brush and flutter of garments, and Diana rushed in, all breezy with the freshness of outdoor air, and caught Mrs. Pitkin in her arms and kissed her first and then the deacon with effusion. Here I come for thanksgiving, she said, in a rich, clear tone, and here, she added, drawing a roll of bills from her bosom, and putting it into the deacon's hand, here's the interest money for this year. I got it all myself, because I wanted to show you I could be good for something. Thank you, dear daughter, said Mrs. Pitkin. I felt sure some way would be found and now I see underscore what underscore. She added, kissing Diana and patting her rosy cheek, a very pleasant, pretty way it is, too. I was afraid that Uncle Silas would worry and put himself back again about the interest money, said Diana. Well, daughter, said the deacon, it's a pity we should go through all we do in this world and not learn anything by it. I hope the Lord has taught me not to worry, but just do my best and leave myself and everything else in his hands. We can't help ourselves we can't make one hair white or black. Why should we wear our lives out fretting? If I'd a known underscore that underscore years ago it would have been better for us all. Never mind, father, you know it now, said his wife, with a face serene as a star. In this last gift of quietude of soul to her husband she recognized the answer to her prayers of years. Well now, said Diana, running to the window, I should like to know what Bea Carter is coming here about. Oh, Bea's been very kind to us in this sickness, said Mrs. Pitkin, as Bea's feet resounded on the scraper. Good evening, Deacon, said Bea, entering, Good evening, Mrs. Pitkin. Sarvent, ma'am, to Diana how ye all get an on. Nicely, be a well as can be, said Mrs. Pitkin. Wall, you see I was up to the store with some of Squire Jones's bell flowers. Sim Cone he said he wanted some to sell, and so I took up a couple of barrels, and I see the darndest big letter there for the deacon. Miss Brisket she was in, lookin' at it, and so was Deacon Simpson's wife she come in arter some cinnamon sticks. Wall, and they all looked at it and talked it over, and couldn't none of them for their lives think what it's all about, it was zish an almighty thick letter, said Bea, drawing out a long, legal-looking envelope and putting it in the deacon's hands. I hope there isn't bad news in it, said Silas Pitkin, the color flushing apprehensively in his pale cheeks as he felt for his spectacles. There was an agitated, silent pause while he broke the seals and took out two documents. One was the mortgage on his farm and the other a receipt in full for the money owed on it. The deacon turned the papers to and fro, gazed on them with a dazed, uncertain air and then said, Why, mother, do look. Underscore is underscore this so. Do I read it right? Certainly, you do, said Diana reading over his shoulder. Somebody's paid that debt, uncle. Thank God, said Mrs. Pitkin, softly, he has done it. Wall, I swow, said Bea, after having turned the paper in his hands, if this air don't beat all. There's old Squire Norcross's name aunt. It's the receipt, full and square. What's come over the old critter, he must a got religion in his old age, but if grace made him do that, grace has done a tough job, that's all, 
but it's done anyhow. And that's all you need to care about. Wall, wall, I must get along hum Mariar Jane'll be wonderin' where I be. Good night, all on ye. And Bia's retreating wagon wheels were off in the distance, rattling furiously, for, notwithstanding Maria Jane's wondering, Bia was resolved not to let an hour slip by without declaring the wonderful tidings at the store. The Pitkin family were seated at supper in the big kitchen, all jubilant over the recent news. The father, radiant with the pleasantest excitement, had for the first time come out to take his place at the family board. In the seven years since the beginning of our story the Pitkin boys had been growing apace, and now surrounded the table quite an army of rosy-cheeked, jolly young fellows, who tonight were in a perfect tumult of animal gaiety. Diana twinkled and dimpled and flung her sparkles round among them, and there was unbounded jollity. Who's that looking in at the window? Called out Sam, age ten, who sat opposite the house door. At that moment the door opened, and a dark stranger, bronzed with travel and dressed in foreign-looking garments, entered. He stood one moment, all looking curiously at him, then crossing the floor, he kneeled down by Mrs. Pitkin's chair, and throwing off his cap, looked her close in the eyes. Mother, don't you know me? She looked at him one moment with that still earnestness peculiar to herself, and then fell into his arms. Oh my son, my son! There were a few moments of indescribable confusion, during which Diana retreated, pale and breathless, to a neighboring window, and stood with her hand over the locket which she had always worn upon her heart. After a few moments he came, and she felt him by her. What, cousin? he said, no welcome from you? She gave one look, and he took her in his arms. She felt the beating of his heart, and he felt hers. Neither spoke, yet each felt at that moment sure of the other. I say, boys, said James, who'll help bring in my sea chest? Never was sea chest more triumphantly ushered, it was a contest who should get near enough to take some part in its introduction, and soon it was open, and James began distributing its contents. There, mother, said he, undoing a heavy black India satin and shaking out its folds, I'm determined you shall have a dress fit for you, and here's a real India shawl to go with it. Get those on and you'll look as much like a queen among women as you ought to. Then followed something for every member of the family, received with frantic demonstrations of applause and appreciation by the more juvenile. Oh, what's that? said Sam as a package done up in silk paper and tied with silver cord was disclosed. That's oh that's my wife's wedding dress, said James, unfolding and shaking out a rich satin, and here's her shawl, drawing out an embroidered box, scented with sandalwood. The boys all looked at Diana, and Diana laughed and grew pale and read all in the same breath, as James, folding back the silk and shawl in their boxes, handed them to her. Mrs. Pitkin laughed and kissed her, and said, gaily, all right, my daughter just right. What an evening that was, to be sure. What a confusion of joy and gladness. What a half-telling of a hundred things that it would take weeks to tell. James had paid the mortgage and had money to spare, and how he got it all, and how he was saved at sea, and where he went, and what befell him here and there he promised to be telling them for six months to come. Well, your father mustn't be kept up too late, said Mrs. Pitkin. Let's have prayers now, and then tomorrow we'll be fresh to talk more. So they gathered around the wide kitchen fire and the family Bible was brought out. Father, said James, drawing out of his pocket the Bible his mother had given him at parting, let me read my psalm, it has been my psalm ever since I left you. There was a solemn thrill in the little circle as James read the verses. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof. 
they mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. O oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. When all had left the old kitchen, James and Diana sat by the yet glowing hearth and listened to the crickets, and talked over all the past and the future. And now, said James, it's seven years since I left you, and tomorrow is the seventh Thanksgiving, and I've always set my heart on getting home to be married Thanksgiving evening. But, dear me, Jim, we can't. There isn't time. Why not? We've got all the time there is. But the wedding dress can't be made, possibly. Oh, that can wait till the week after. You are pretty enough without it. But what will they all say? Who cares what they say? I don't, said James. The fact is, I've set my heart on it, and you owe me something for the way you treated me the last Thanksgiving I was here, seven years ago. Now don't you? Well, yes, I do, so have it just as you will. And so it was accomplished the next evening. And among the wonders of Mapleton Miss Brisket announced it as chief, that it was the first time she ever heard of a bride that was married first and had her wedding dress made the week after. She never had heard of such a thing. Yet, strange to say, for years after neither of the parties concerned found themselves a bit the worse for it.